I'm not going to be covering the basics in this session. I will just go ahead and cover uh, the features that will be most helpful to you in the coming weeks and months. And if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Cami Griffith, who is uh, one of our wonderful reps from New England, will be monitoring the chats and she'll probably actively respond to some of them directly and then others I'll pause and see if we have questions that are going on. And so Sure, we get those answered for you. So to make sure you know uh, what we're covering in case you get knocked out by the internet and want to make sure you come back in. Uh, so we're going to start with just some general support items that we have regularly available. And then some of the main tools that you'll be using, the Read the Web extension, the Kurzweil taskbar and the Kurzweil3000.com, which includes Google Drive, uh, the Universal Library. And then also uh, some specific tools for testing, such as the profile locks, the password feature, and then document locks. And then finally, a couple hints on and helps on how to turn in documents so the student can do it directly, not have to come through you. And then also just show a quick overview of the installed the desktop client so that you can see a couple extra features there. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, you guys get the best support that's available. And so that is go.kurzweiledu.com forward slash news forward slash COVID. I go ahead and encourage you to write that down so that you have reference to it. You can see already we've got some other webinars planned. We will continue to do updates on this website as well. And so go.kurzweiledu.com forward slash news forward slash COVID-19. And also on here, uh, as many of you know, that we are doing free licenses for individuals who may be uh, all of a sudden teaching their kids at home or need to support students remotely that they're used to having in the classroom who don't currently have Kurzweil. And you're welcome to share this with them. Let them know that we're offering this. It includes an administrative profile as well as two student licenses. Normally, uh, our trial is for 30 days and it's one pro administrative profile and one license. And right now, uh, this free license is uh, during the COVID changes and it is two licenses. So that will be updated as time comes once we know, uh, you know, how long this is going to last and such forth. But uh, we want to make sure that you're covered during these unusual teaching times. Also on here, uh, in addition to this training, if you would have any questions that you'd like a one-on-one, -on -one, then you are welcome to um, meet with one of us individually. With a, We can do a 30-minute session with you and answer some specific questions or um, you know, just review over items that you have. So feel free to reach out to us. Also, we're having a great deal right now with um, our professional trainers. Uh, normally a one-on-one -on -one session with our professional trainers is $125. We are covering $25 of that because the, um, we just want to make sure that you guys get the support that you need during this time. And our professional trainers are excellent. They have not only a really strong understanding of Kurzweil like we do, but also they have many of them have been involved in the educational field sometimes for many years. And so they're really good at knowing the specific applications that might be a little bit nitty gritty sometimes. So excellent opportunity there. And then down here at the bottom, this is one of the main reasons I want you to to be aware of this site is there's some really great links here. It's kind of an all-in-one spot. We are going to be talking about the extensions. And so we do have a Read the Web extension for Chrome and one for Firefox. And so uh, you can add those. That'll be the first one cover. I'll show you how to add them. We do have an iPad app. And also there's a nice little tutorial for web, uh, Read the Web for the Chrome. Uh, the Chrome and the Firefox items are identical and they work identically. So if you're using Firefox, uh, you can watch this video and it will work as well. Here we also have a link to our website and a nice little tutorial of uh, overview of how to use the website. 
Then over here, we have links into downloading the installed software. There are a couple tools and features that will be a benefit to you for the individuals to have the installed version of the software if they're currently using just the web license. So they're using just the web uh, site as part of the web license. They do have the um, inclusion of the installed version as part of that license. And so they can click here and download that. And then also we have the Kurzweil Academy, which has some great uh, how-to videos. And then some items here um, on additional tools and helps. Now let's switch over to the main website, kurzweiledu.com. And there's a couple things on here that I want to cover. The first one is the Kurzweil Academy. Hopefully many of you are already familiar with the Academy. I'm just going to click here. And we'll, once you click into this, it gives you four tabs of tools, of videos to watch. The first one is more overview tools. How do I get started with Kurzweil? How do I use uh, the Google Drive? How do I get files into Kurzweil and, and manage them? So a number of different basic getting things uploaded, getting going videos. The next three tabs, the read and study, the writing and the testing, are individual videos on the tools. And so if I want to know how to use the writing templates or a graphic organizer, uh, the split screen is an excellent one to know how to use. I can come in here and these are about 30 seconds to about three minutes. They're nice short videos that will cover all the really frequently used tools within Kurzweil. And so it's a great way for yourself, your staff, or your students to be able to access this. How do I? at any time of the day. The next tab up here is the Educator's Lounge. And this is targeted more towards the administrative side when you're setting up documents. So this is zone editing, underlying text, uh, how to set a page range if I wanna upload a really big book by chapter, feature locks, different things like that that are more likely to be used by an administrator or a teacher. The third item in, the, in here that's really useful is the new features and Kurzweil regularly puts out new updates. You can see last month we did one every year. Last year, we did one every month. Uh, this year we're working on some underlying architecture for some future improvements. So we're not doing one every month right now, but we will continue to consistently have updates. So you can see we have one for February. We are gonna have one in April coming out soon. So on this page, I can link into here and have a PDF that has the screenshots and step by instru instructions to use each of the new items and just explain what they are. So that's super helpful. Also over here, I can update the software by clicking on here or I can update it through my installed version of the software. Now with the website, of course, no updates are required because that takes place on our side. These updates are for the installed desktop client. So that's the Kurzweil Academy. And then the other thing that's on this main, uh, clicked back to the wrong page. Oops, I closed the wrong one. That's where it went. Just a moment. We'll go back to kurzweiledu.com. And the other thing I want to show you right here is the support. And during this time, of course, there's going to be a lot of questions uh, with new people trying to download the software and everything. So we do have two support options available. One is customer service. This is for if I have questions on my account, if, um, if I need to get more licenses available, when is my subscription renewing, things like that. The technical support is one that most people will be using. And that is more for I am having technical issues with my software. It's not, hey, how do I use the highlighter? It's I've been using the highlighter and for some reason it stopped. Uh, most of the time, updating your software will solve probably 80% of the issues. When people call in, I'm like, okay, upgrade your software. Let's do that first. And they call back, you know, it's fine. They don't ever end up going to technical support. But if you do need technical support, you click through onto the next page. And this has down here, you can see a number of helpful items so that you can possibly get your answer right here. And if not, here's the contact information. They're 8 to 4.30 Central Time. 
and it has phone number, email that you can reach out to them and um, they will be able to help you with just about any issue you're gonna have as long as it's under Kurzweil control. Um, now a common question we've been getting over the last few days is can we use Kurzweil with lockdown websites? There are so many of them. We have information on yes, I can on this one, no, I can't. Uh, our tech support does not have that information. What we encourage you to do is try it on the website and if you're having challenges, reach out to that company because each company has their own variations on how they're gonna block things and whether they have uh, you know, back doors that they can give you permissions and things like that. So that is one thing, unfortunately, that we don't cover on inside just because it is way too varied. But anybody that's using Kurzweil has access, so whether it be yourself, a student that's downloading the software, uh, something, you know, has given them a, a, a stump, they can't get it installed, they can't get something to work, then you call our tech support. Uh, for the how-tos, as I mentioned, please use the Kurzweil Academy because there's a lot of great information there. Okay, so I'm just going to check back over here and make sure I covered the items. All right. And then let's go ahead and move over to the tools. I'm going to start with the browser extension, and then we'll cover uh, the taskbar, and then we'll move into Kurzweil 3000, which is where we'll spend a fair bit of our time. So go back to websites here. Okay. So with the Kurzweil taskbar, it's really easy to use. I'm going to go ahead and actually remove mine so I can show you how, I'm sorry, not the Kurzweil taskbar, the read the web extension how easy it is. So I've opened up a new web, a new tab here, a new window. And I like doing that because it makes the apps really easy to find. If for some reason I can't find the apps, I can just Google the web store and it will take me to the web store page. Once I'm in the web store, I want to Google Kurzweil 3000. Now there are other Kurzweil companies that uh, support other technologies invented by Ray Kurzweil, such as synthesizers and things like that, which is why I always recommend typing Kurzweil 3000 and not just Kurzweil. Here we see the Read the Web extension, and it's really easy. I just click Add to Chrome. If it's already been added, it will ask me to rate it. So that's how I know if it's there. I verify that I want to add it, and in a moment here, it's going to pop up. And you see it's got a bar across it. There's nothing really on this page to read. So it has a bar saying it's not going to work on this page. So let's switch pages here. And I'm going to go to scholar.google.com and just click on wind farms here, something I've already searched for. And these are really pretty scholarly, so not necessarily the most interesting articles, but it shows very easily how to use the toolbar. So I'm just gonna click onto this page and it's taken a little moment to load here. Okay, now once I'm on the page, you can see that my Kurzweil taskbar no longer has the X across it, the icon, but it does, it is gray, meaning it's not activated. So I'm gonna click on it and I'm gonna log in using the same login password that I do for the website. Okay. So this is my basic tools here. I love getting students started with this tool because it's so simple to use. Say, you know, go to a web page you like, click the cursor on the page where you want to start reading. Now I'm using a headset so that I have better, better audio quality. So I don't think you'll hear this read, but you will see a highlight. Okay, so it's really super simple. Just place the cursor and click read. Over here under settings and options, I guess, I can pick my voice. So if my student, my, my son, I apologize, not my student, my son likes the British voices. He said that Lucy sounds like she should be a teacher and it helped him focus. And so you can pick different voices that you like better, maybe one that sounds like your teacher so you remember what class it is. And we support 11 European languages. So if you have a student that is a foreign language speaker and wants to read a website in their native language, or maybe they're studying a foreign language and want to listen to it, get some practice, I can pick one of those 11 languages. Down here, I can speed it up or slow it down. So if I have a student that say maybe is dyslexic, but when they hear the text, they have no processing challenges, 
it's very common for dyslexics to listen at about 300 or 350 words a minute. So I would definitely speed it up. If I had a situation where maybe I'm reading something technical like a chemistry book, or I have something where I need to kind of just slow it down and, and think a little bit more about what I'm reading or what I'm hearing, I would slow it down. The unit and the mode are really, really helpful. It defaults to sentence. When I clicked on read, it highlighted the first sentence. It will read that and then highlight the next sentence. I can move that up or down. And then the mode is set to continuous. That means it's just going to read until I tell it to be quiet. If I'm doing, say, a homework assignment where um, the I need to stop and answer a question or maybe I'm doing a test, I'm going to change it to self-paced. That way it will read one sentence, one paragraph, whichever I set it to. Self-paced in one word is really, really slow. Don't encourage that um, unless you really need to. But it gives me a chance to listen to my question and then answer it. Or like if I'm reading that chemistry book, it gives me a chance to slow down and say, what was all that? And read it over a couple times. If I need to jump back a unit and listen to that sentence two or three times, it only can jump me back one sentence instead of one paragraph if I have it set there. And then, of course, I can jump it around if it's covering anything on my screen. And it is defaulted to read alt text for images on the web. I can uncheck that if we, uh, if I want to. So those are my voice options, my reading options. Really nice, uh, customizable to my student. A couple other features on here are the dictionary and the translation tool. The dictionary is really easy to use. So let's go with the word uh, significant. I just, oh, let's go with one in the middle of the line because it put my cursor at the end of the previous line. That looked weird. Uh, we'll go with experience. I just clicked on it. Now I click on the dictionary. It loads it. I can to it. And then I can also adjust the dictionary level or use the thesaurus here. When I'm done, I just click off of it. It's that easy. I don't have to go anywhere. I don't have to forget I'm doing my homework while I'm looking at an online dictionary somewhere and read 15 articles. In the last tool that's on here that's super helpful is um, to use the translation tool. The translation tool uses Google Translate with a little curves while magic. So I can select an individual word if I'm you know, an English language learner and I know most of a sentence, or I can select the whole sentence because context is important. Again, I have the same 11 European supported languages. So let's go with French this time. It will translate my sentence or whatever I've highlighted to French. And then the next time I need to translate something, it will remember I selected French and it will just translate it straight for me. Saves me a little effort and time, a little mental real estate. And that will stay there until I sign out uh, and sign back in. Then I'll have to select it once again. The uh, translation tool, as I mentioned, does use Google Translate as a, the underlying uh, engine. So in addition to the 11 Kurzweil languages, we have uh, access to about 92 total languages. So if I want to read something in simplified Chinese because I'm from the mainland, I can put it in simplified Chinese. Uh, if I'm a student from Hong Kong or Taiwan, I can put it into traditional Chinese. It will not read it to me verbally, but it will translate it written. So I do have access to all the languages for that. Now, the Read the Web extension works really well for reading internet-based text. So on here, I can read the text here. I can read most of these ads. Up here, I've got a picture. It's not going to read the picture because it's not text-based. In my online classes like Canvas and Moodle and things like that, we have the same limitations. I'll show you how to get around that in just a minute. Um, but it works really, really well. Now, um, I have heard from some individuals with Canvas that they feel that the Firefox uh, browser works slightly smoother than the the uh, Chrome browser right now. We've made a couple changes and it. It's uh, made it a little bit less smooth. So we're working on that and hopefully have it you know, back to picture perfect here very soon. Uh, but if you do have any troubles with one browser, please try the other one. It may completely solve the problem. If you still continue to have any issues, of course, you can reach out to our tech support uh, on this as you can on um, the, the other software issues that you might have. But this is a really simple tool. Normally works super slick and smooth. 
And so uh, one thing I've heard about working with Canvas is that Kurzweil generally does work really, really well. Um, that if you open the document first and then open Kurzweil, uh, it will be a little bit smoother. And um, but generally speaking, it does work quite well. And I've just been very, very recently, the last day or two as part of this big outreach, uh, that I had a couple of people say they just recently started having uh, a little bit of glitchiness with it. It's not real bad, and we are working on that. So um, go ahead and try it. Uh, if you have any issues with the Chrome, please try the Firefox. And as I said, if it's still giving you any glitchiness or any problems, please reach out to our tech support so that we can see exactly what's going on and get that corrected as fast as possible. Now, as I mentioned, the Read the Web extension reads text. It does not read um, images. So to uh, resolve that issue, we have the Read the Web extension. And let me just make sure, yes, you guys can see my taskbar. Okay. So down here at the bottom in the right-hand corner, you see the Kurzweil taskbar. Now, the Kurzweil taskbar is a desktop-based tool. It comes with the installed version of the software. So if you need to use it and your student is, to this date has only used the website, they will need to install the download version of the software. And uh, that was on that first page I showed you. It had the link to that. And then if you have uh, any troubles with it, uh, reach out to us. We can give you some pointers. And now... I'm going to show you here how to load the Kurzweil taskbar. So once I've installed the software, I just come down here to my main taskbar at the bottom of my screen. I right click, I go to toolbars, and I just click on Kurzweil taskbar so that it is checked. And you can see it popped up right here. Now there's two tools in here that I'm gonna use regularly, and it just depends on what the website you're on or what it is that you're reading. And so the first way to do this is if I can highlight and drag the text, I can take it and I can bring it over here. And this fights with GoToMeeting, so I'm not going to show it, but I would drop it in this first box right here, the, the white box with the little Kurzweil icon. That will drop it into the read box. It will pop it open in a, in a pop-up window and read it to me. So if I'm reading my email, if I'm reading a PowerPoint, if I'm reading a PDF that's text and not image-based, I can read pretty much anything to uh, that I can drag the text into the box. Now, there are going to be some additional items that are completely image-based, such as, say, I've got this picture right here. So I come down here, sorry, and I click on the blue one that looks like the little camera icon, the image reader. I click on that, I get the crosshairs, and I'm just going to draw a box around what I want. So if I'm taking a test online and the test is in a website, I, and I can open the Read the Web ex extension, I can just click there, I put it the question one, and I read it. If that website's more locked down, it won't let me do that. I come down here to the taskbar. I draw the box around the question. It'll read question one, question two, question three, whatever it is that I highlight. The first time this opens, sometimes it will take about 30 seconds or so because it has to open the uh, OCR engine. After that, it's really, really fast. And so it's a really nice tool to use. This is a PC version of the software tool. It does not have a taskbar in the Mac version, but in the Mac version, the installed version of the software, there is an image reader built into the software. The biggest difference between the two is if I have the software open, so here's the Kurzweil one, if I was go in and find the image reader and highlight something on the internet, what it does is it shrinks down my window, I have my internet page pop up, I draw my box, it pops the Kurzweil back up, and it loads it into Kurzweil. So it's a little bit slower. Uh, this version is really nice because it just sits there on the side. So using either the Read the Web extension, 
the text reader box or the image reader, I can read anything on my screen. I can access any software. If it's a Word document, a JPEG, a picture I took of a sign, uh, it doesn't really matter I, if I can draw a box around it and the software recognizes it as text, I can read it. So that is the Kurzweil taskbar. There were uh, a number of questions from the last webinar on doing that. Uh, so I tried covering it a little bit slower, a little more detail this time. Uh, but if you would like a demonstration of it, uh, something more detailed, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we'll be happy to walk you through it and uh, get you using it. Once you've used it once or twice, it's really, really easy. And so I've got the, the window open. It looks like people are having their questions answered as we go. Uh, Cami, do you have any questions for me? If you can just pop it into the chat there and let me know. Okay, I'm not seeing anything. So hopefully that means that there's no questions and I'm not skipping over it. So those are the two uh, tools that are just really helpful. They're small. They just jump on whatever you have. The next one we're going to cover is Kurzweil3000.com. And in Kurzweil3000.com, we have a few different things that are really, really helpful for you. First of all, uh, last year, our engineers spent a lot of time making the software size responsive. So that means I can open it up on my big computer screen at home or at work. I can open it on my little bit smaller laptop. I can open it on a tablet or an iPad. I can open it on my phone. And as it shrinks down, it will pull up the appropriate screen sizing and shrink everything in a way that it's still manageable. So that's a really, really nice benefit about using the website is it is size responsive. So our students can uh, access that from pretty much any device and they can uh, use it uh, via Wi-Fi or if they're on their phone via um, their data. The next thing I want to talk about on the website that's really useful is this right here, the Universal Library. And the reason this is super helpful is right now is everybody's scattered. Uh, Students aren't going to be coming in to take tests and they're not going to be coming in to get work or bringing it into you say here scan this for me. So I here have a folder for each individual that's on my team and that means I can see myself. I'm the administrator. I see my teachers that I have associated with me and then I see my students that I have associated with me as well. And I'll show you how to make sure that's set up in just a minute. The, if a teacher is logged in, they will see themselves, the top level coordinator, and only the students associated with that teacher. If a student is logged in, they will see themselves, the top level coordinator, and only the teachers they're linked to. They will not ever see other students, and they won't see other teachers that aren't pertinent to them. In order to get a document into Kurzweil, it's really, really super easy. So here I've already got, you can see a whole bunch of stuff in my folder. If I just want to open something from my computer, like I would open a Microsoft Word document, I just click on computer. I go and I pick my document and click open and it just pops it open right there. That's helpful if it's in the student's computer or my computer. But if I need to give it to a student, that's not my best option. What I want to do is I'm going to click in the folder I want to put it in. So here I'm going to click in Casey's public folder and see he's already got a few items in there. I'm going to come over to upload. Nice orange button, easy to see. And I am going to give Casey the wind energy quiz, which I already have, so it might tell me that. Oh, nope, it is uploading it. Um, I have two of the quizzes in there, two different formats. And so this is now popped into Casey's folder. When Casey logs into Kurzweil, he can go in there and there's his quiz right there. He doesn't have to uh, call me or worry about an email not being big enough, anything like that. It's just there available for me. I can email and say, hey, I dumped your document into your folder. This also is unlimited size. So if I'm doing a one page quiz or a 700 page biology book, I can upload it, it doesn't matter. It's on Kurzweil servers and it's cloud-based, so we know it's always compatible 
and it's available. And so if you're doing a really big book, maybe I'm going to do it a chapter at a time to make uploads easier and, and make it easier to get through for the student. But I can go ahead and store the whole book in the library. So a great way to get materials back and forth. A couple other items. If I put something into my folder and I'm like, oops, I was supposed to give that to Kevin, I can just click on it. All right, sorry. I don't want to click on it. I want to click on the box to the left of it. So let's go back there. Public. Uh, I'm going to open up Kevin's folder. And then I'm going to, let's do the book report. I'm going to check the box next to book report. Now I can do this a couple of ways. If I just drag, you can see it says moving one file. And I can put it in there and then it's in Kevin's file. I have lost the copy of it. If I do control and drag, it now says copying one file. So I can dump it in Kevin's folder and I can click on it twice by accident. Um, let's see where we're comparing contrast. I'm just gonna control and drag it. And I'm going to open Kevin's folder. I'm sorry, I keep letting go and putting it back in there. And when I put it back in, it opens it again. Um, so that's why it keeps popping open because I keep dumping it back into the main folder. So I want to make sure that I actually click, drag, and drop, and then it doesn't open on me. Okay, so if it's in my folder, I can do that. I can also just highlight it, click the button here, and I can do copy and move as well. These buttons are really handy, and then I don't accidentally open it. And so either way, whatever works best for you, it's really simple to get items moved around. Also, we have Bookshare. So if your student has a diagnosed print disability, such as dysgraphia, dyslexia, they can open stuff directly from Bookshare. They have over 600,000 titles in digital format. And so it's a really, really good resource for non-textbook uh, type of books. The last one up here is the Google Drive. And there's a couple things that are great about this. If I'm a Google school, I'm already using Google Drive. I don't have to start using the Kurzweil library. I can just click in here. I can go into my Google folders. You can see I have access more than one here. So I just pick which one I want. And then I can uh, go into like shared with me. If it's a teacher shared it with me, that's usually where I'll be. I'll pick my folder. I click select and it opens it straight into Kurzweil without having to uh, mess with it. Now, another thing I can do is I can go into Google Drive, into Google Docs, and I can use the Read the Web extension in Google Docs. And so, there's uh, while work in D2L, that's one that's one of those more locked down websites that we're not sure about. And you'll have to give it a shot. And if, it, uh, if it's blocked or something, reach out to D2L and see what uh, they can do for you. And if you can't use the Read the Web extension, then you're going to use the taskbar down here. So that's one of those that it's a, a good example of. And um, so that's the universal library, getting folders and, and items back and forth. Another thing that's really helpful, we've heard a lot of kids, especially in the K-12 level, are going home with packets. And so if I'm at home and I don't have a scanner, but I have a nice cell phone camera, I can snap a photo of it. I want to try and make sure it's, it's straight. If it's all crooked, it'll make it harder to character recognize. A nice straight photo, I put it into my Google Drive, I open it from my Google Drive. Kurzweil uses OCR software to pull the text out of it, and voila, I've got an open document. Two other things in here before I switch to topics are the Classic Literature Library. This has about 1,800 books in it. We recently went sure and made sure we have the 100 most read books on um, Project Gutenberg, so a great big pull of what's most commonly read there. And all these are open source books and they're already in digital format for the students just to be able to open and read into Kurzweil. So that's a really nice resource again uh, for non-textbooks, but items I'd likely read in the high school or early college level English class. And then the bottom item here, the templates are uh, there's higher ed and K-12. I can look, I, I recommend looking in both of those because 
They both have really good items. Uh, if I'm in high school, I have like a college application. And if I'm in K-12, uh, I have some compare and contrast essays, some different options that I don't have in the, the higher ed because I didn't duplicate them. So say I want to do a compare. I like the compare and contrast one. I'm going to click it open here. And just so that you can see this warning pops up, I can click in here, I can type, I can do all sorts of stuff, but this document has been read open from the master folder, so I can't save it. So it's going to give me that warning right in front of my document. What I want to do instead is I'm going to do the copy. I'm going to drag it, copy it to my own folder. And then once I open it from my own folder, it's my copy. Okay, and I've already got it in there, so it's telling me I can't do it again. Um, but uh, it's my personal copy. I can then go in and I can change the name and I can do all the editing I want. So a couple helpful resources that are available right here already loaded in the library. Okay, uh, do we have any questions? I've been seeing that there... Does Kurzweil read math books? Not real well. Unfortunately, there is no software that does. One of the things that I found that can uh, give you a somewhat good result is using the image reader because then I have really good control over how much I highlight. Um, so if I've got a fraction, I can read the numerator and the denominator separately. It's not going to read it as two thirds. Um, and also if I have a, a big math equation, five X squared plus seven X, it will just say 5x to plus 7x. It won't say squared or cubed and, and stuff like that. Unfortunately, there isn't a really good software for that uh, without a lot of extra work. If it's not a really big assignment and you do want to uh, adjust it, you can go in and you can edit underlying text. And, oh, I'm going a little slow here. I'm trying to speed up and I'll show you the underlying text. Okay. Um, so the next thing I want to show is the uh, profile subscription. If you are a top level coordinator, you have access to this page. And during this uh, time when so many people are, are out for long periods, we've upped our offline mode. And this is for the install version of the software uh, to 45 days. So if I have the installed version on my laptop, I can take my laptop to McDonald's or wherever, get on their Wi-Fi, log in, and then I can work offline for 45 days using any tool that doesn't require the internet and any document that's on my hard drive. So uh, our previous limit was 18 days, so that's what your limit's probably set to right now, and you do need to go in and manually change that. Now, the... Um, in the account, I have my team. And then, um, so I talked about if you want to see the folders, you need to make sure the student is associated with you. And when you set up the profile under the Everyone tab and Students, I just make sure that it's checked on my team. That's all I need to do. Then I'll be able to see their folders. I can come in here if they forgot their password. I can send them a password reset email. Or depending on the privacy settings, maybe I can see the password. And I can tell them their username. The one I'm really interested on here though is the team feature locks. So this kind of goes into testing. And so with the team feature locks, if I've got Kevin here and he's taking a test, I lock him out of spell check and word prediction. And so once I check these boxes, you know, say so I click Casey out of outline and brainstorm, I want to see how well he organizes a paragraph for some reason. That's the test of the day. Um, he's not going to be able to use those pretty immediately, and he can't use them until I uncheck them. So this is a profile lock. I don't need to go into the student's pro, uh, login. I just come in here into the administrative page, find their name, and I've got quite a few feature locks, Google Drive, zone editing, underlying text, uh, dictionaries, translation tools, uh, you can see there's quite a few. Now, one thing that a lot of schools do to make this simplified is one of their student profiles they create as a testing profile. So testing one, testing two, and then they just lock up the testing profile. And then when they give the student the test, they say, it's in this profile, go take it. And then they don't have to worry about who took the test when, um, but they can just do it 
um, just leave it locked up and they can modify it if students have different accommodations. So that was under my account and users and then team feature locks. Another way I can assist with testing is once I've opened a document, I have a couple things I can do to it. So let's go ahead and open the wind energy quiz and Okay, I have previously set a password on here, so I'm going to enter my password. And of course, my computer started going really slow all of a sudden, just a moment. Um, so this is what the student would see if I password protect a document. The benefit of this is if I want to email the document to the student early just to make sure they have it, they can confirm, yes, it's in my folder, but they can't open it until it has been they have the password and then I can give that to them at the time they're supposed to open it. And that's really simple to do. I just come up here to document options, set password, type in the password, verify the password, make sure it's something I'm not going to forget and set password or I can remove it later. Now, one way to control how long a student has access to a test, say it's a time test, is I give them the test. I give them the password and in an hour I say you have to have it turned in. I can go get it, I can take it out of their folder. I can also go in and uh, once I've retrieved that I can say take, I can change the password so they can't access it again. And so we don't have a timer say you have one hour and then this document's gonna close. Uh, Kurzweil does not have a time feature like that, but with using the password you can kind of approximate something to those conditions. Another item that's really helpful is the lock features. And so the lock features are similar to what I just showed you, but those were on a profile. So if I locked up Jenny, Jenny's locked out until I remember to unlock her or she's done with whatever and I unlock her. This, however, locks a document. So if I just wanna create a test, I wanna put the locks on it, the student has three days to take it at their convenience. I don't know when it's gonna be in, so I can't really lock their profile down. I can lock the document. So you can see here, I've already put prevent copying and printing, uh, prevent printing the document. Um, there's a whole lot of locks that I can add to a document. It's actually a little more extensive. So I've locked the dictionary and synonyms, and let's go ahead and lock translate too. Okay, so I just click okay. Once I selected them, it tells me that they're locked. When I opened the document, it actually told me there were some locked features on it, if you caught that pop up. And now, once I have this locked, all I have to do is, it's in my universal library, I copy it to the student. When the student opens it, it locks up their Kurzweil profile. And that profile stays locked with those features until they've closed the document, they log out of Kurzweil, and then they log back in. If they reopen the document, it relocks their profile but it's pretty simple. Uh, send them the lock document, open it, locks are active. When they're done, they close it, they log out, log back in and everything's reset. So uh, that's document feature locks, the password, and then we already did uh, the profile locks. Here uh, is for turning in homework. I can download, oh, I blocked it, I can't copy it. So let's go get a, a document that's not all protected and um, we'll just do this one i'm i'm in a, a, a wind energy mood today Let's see if i remember the password good i did um so it's going to open it and this is a pdf that i downloaded and uh say this was a word document i had been typing for my class and i needed to turn it in I can't turn it in Kesey format. My teacher doesn't have Kurzweil. So I can download it as a Microsoft Word document or as a PDF, depending on how I need to turn it in. Now you can see in here, I've got a, a, a notes. Uh, if I had highlights, if I download it as a PDF, it's gonna keep all that. It basically takes a snapshot. If I download it as a Word document, because a sticky note's not a Word document feature, I am going to lose, um, those sticky notes and my highlights and things like this. But now if I was just writing an essay, I had to turn it in. The student no longer needs to give it to me to turn in for them. Uh, rather, they just go directly 
uh, download it and submit it uh, to their teacher. And I like doing it in Chrome because then I can see it pops up right here. Um, just personal little preference myself. And uh, let me check our, let's see. Oh, and the print function. Okay. I knew there was something I was forgetting. So the print function, I can just print the document right here, print page. And so if I just want to print the document, turn in a hard copy, which might not be super relevant right now, um, but once the kids return to class, they can turn in a hard copy as well. And so that is an option. So I have a lot of control over this. If I'd taken a photo with my camera and it was sideways, I can rotate it. I can do some nice things with that. And so that gets me through the learning process. Now, I wanted also to show you real quick the installed version of the software. Uh, you may be familiar with it already. It has the similar tools on my landing page. I can open items. I can uh, open a previous viewed documents. I can open existing files from my computer, my library, or my Google Drive. And I, these are my templates that I showed you that were in the blue folders. And so similar tools with the reading pages. This does have more options than the website. We took the most common, most used tools and put them in the website. The ones aren't so frequent with the frequently used, we left them in here so that we can keep the website cleaner and simpler to use. But I can take a item, say I know I'm not gonna be opening column notes, I can right click on it and remove it. I can right click and I can add buttons so I can customize it. I can get it really simple for my younger students. I can get really advanced with all the tools for my more advanced students. And then we have a read tab, a write tab, and a scan tab, and then I created a custom one. Well, it's blank now, but uh, over there. So I can go ahead and I can customize each process and that way it keeps the number of buttons I'm having to look at to a minimum. And then also in the installed version of the software, we do have the option of creating an audio file. So I have this document open, I create an audio file, I tell it what type I want, where to put it and click OK. And it will take anything that's set as a primary zone and create my audio file so my student can listen to it as an MP3. And then also I wanna show you the tools bar here because this has some great things on it. So if I'm uploading a new document and I wanna check and see what words are not in the spell check or make sure they're pronounced correctly, rank spelling will show me the word that shows up 75 times. Um, so I'm gonna start with that then maybe starting, if it shows up once, I don't care so much. Uh, speech to text. Uh, is also available through here. It's available at the button uh, on the website. And then um, pronunciations, I can edit. I can fill in the blanks to prep for a test. And then options, I wanna show you the options. So this here is where I get super customizable with Kurzweil. If my student's using the installed version, I can customize a crazy amount in here. I can change the color of the highlights if my students got uh, blue, green color blindness, I can change it to red and yellow uh, or whatever I might need. I can change the text colors, the background colors, the size of the text, uh, how fast it reads, the pitch, all sorts of things like that. And then also right here, there's one called speak buttons, which is really helpful. If I have a student that is visually impaired, but needs additional writing support of Kurzweil 3000 rather than Kurzweil 1000, I click on speak buttons. And then when I hover over, I click okay, it highlights my buttons and it's telling me what that is. If I come up to the file, it reads each option to me as I hover over it. So I'm gonna turn this off because now it's reading to me really fast. Oh, excuse me, that is a great little feature. And so really, really customizable here under tools and options. Um, this is what I would be using if I'm in the offline mode. The, about the only things that aren't available are the uh, online tools here. If I do have a student that needs a medical dictionary, that is under online reference here. Uh, we do have the Merriam-Webster medical dictionary. That's a common question we get too. So a lot of features, a lot of ways to help your students with the remote learning and 
if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. I think that's primarily what I wanted to cover.